千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now. To be fully present and mindfully aware, as we all ready ourselves for this sacred process of the Tao. Seventy. As we talked about before, the Chinese title for Chapter Seventy, Huai Yu Zhang, is the whole jade within. Chapter. So jade here, as we talked about, represents precious virtues and the precious Tao. So it is not a literal piece of jade. Holding the jade is holding the Tao, or holding virtues. And this jade, quote unquote, is held close to oneself because. The nature of the Tao is not showing off; it is not to flaunt. Therefore, it's held close and not lifted up to be shown to everyone. So, when we looked at the chapter, here's what we saw: a relatively short chapter with nine lines, and we were able to go through. The sectional analysis to divide it up into three sections. We have the beginning section, which is a couple of lines that introduce the main idea. We have the middle section, which is all about Lao Tzu describing himself and how people do not understand him. And then we have the concluding section of three lines, which ends in the line. Plain clothes, but holds jade, which is where the chapter title comes from. So last time we were able to go pretty far. We were able to get to the end of section two, the middle section. And now what I want to do is to remind everyone about the question that we started out with, and then do a quick recap. Of what we talked about so far, because the questions that we started asking, we've been able to uncover some answers. So these were the questions that we began with: Why do people not understand Lao Tzu? And we have an interest in understanding his words because they can be very powerful when applied to one's life. So then, the related question is, what made Lao Tzu so different that people had trouble understanding him? And the same is true today. How is this so different from the typical kind of mentality that people even today don't really know or understand Lao Tzu? Question number two. So what about Yin and Yang. We talked about the people who don't understand him. Let's also talk about the people who do. Who are they? Who are the people that actually do understand the Tao and therefore understand Lao Tzu? If Lao Tzu says that there are very few, are we among them? Can we count ourselves to be among the ones who actually understand him and the Tao? And is it possible to figure out? What Lao Tzu thinks as approximately how few there are out there, and you may think that we don't really have a way to tell what he meant by a few, but it turns out there is one way which we're going to get to later on today. So to continue 
with a recap, this slide is the key questions that we started out with, and then we've been looking for answers along the way as we went line by line. So the first part of the answer to the questions is that people can oftentimes make the simple DAO complicated. So here in the recap slide, I am highlighting a couple of elements. As you can see, the beginning part of line one and the beginning part of line two. So it starts with, my words are easy to understand, and then right below it, the world cannot understand, meaning most people in the world cannot understand. So what Lao Tzu meant was a comment reflective of Tao sages in general. The sages that he studied and himself as a sage and the other sages who were his contemporaries, they've always been plain spoken. They never did speak in riddles. They never tried to complicate things. They wanted to use everyday examples, analogies, metaphors that would make what they said easy to comprehend. Now, the world still had trouble understanding them, and there are multiple reasons for that. And part of it is human nature. There is a human tendency to make something simple complicated. When we do that to ourselves, we only make things more difficult, not easier. And when I say in this slide that some people have a vested interest in making things more complex, I am actually talking about the people who are in a position of authority to talk about the Tao. This could be people who present themselves as experts, people who teach the Tao, people who call themselves masters, who self-title Tao master, and then want to teach that mastery to other people. They complicate things, which is actually a revelation that indeed they do not possess the mastery they claim. If they did understand the Tao completely, they would present the Tao similar to the ancient sages and be plain spoken. So this is one part of it. There is another part we're gonna to get to, but the part that we see today is even more so than ancient times. In ancient times, at least they had the common language. They didn't have the language barrier. They could explain the Tao in the same language that it was written. In the modern world, today in the West, we're using a different language. We're studying the Tao using mostly English. So there's that cultural and linguistic barrier to contend with. And it also provides an opportunity for people to make things even more complicated. So last time, I talked about several different ways that I have seen people do that. So those, for instance, who like to show off their academic knowledge will talk about the many variants, many different versions of the Tao Te Ching. They are not talking about the fact that roughly seven to 800 years after the time of Lao Tzu, the variants were consolidated, unified, standardized into one version, the Wang Bi version, that has since been used for over 1700 years. So that is the version that is most responsible for being part of the, the fabric of Eastern culture. So that is the one that we mostly stick to. And it is not meant to be complicated by the fact that prior to that, there were many different variants. Of course there were, and it's okay. It's been consolidated. Let's focus on what's been happening over the last 17 centuries. People study the version, 
that was consolidated, we're going to study something that's very close to that version as well. Number two, people who claim to be knowledgeable will oftentimes talk about the many interpretations possible for every single line of the Tao Te Ching. So one of the reasons why I wanted to present these talks the way that I do, oftentimes dipping into the character by character explanation of a particular line is precisely because I want to show that indeed these lines do not lend themselves to many interpretations. Once in a while, it's a rare situation when we come across a line that can be interpreted in two different ways or three different ways. But most of the lines in all 81 chapters of the Tao Te Ching have standard agreed upon interpretations. They don't have the many varying interpretations that some of these experts claim. And of course, whenever you see people claiming that, they want to present their own exp explanation as the, as the correct one, as the one to follow. But most of the time, it is not really that trustworthy, only because they don't really understand the common interpreted, um, accepted explanations that's been around for 1,700 years. Lastly, people like to say that every Chinese character has multiple definitions. Well, it's true in some cases, but no different than when we say that every English word has multiple definitions. In many cases, that's true. And we certainly have English words that only have a few or maybe even one definition. Same with Chinese. Modern Chinese, ancient Chinese, all the same. So just because we see multiple entries of definitions in a dictionary, that doesn't mean that every single one of the definitions is equally valid. In English, we know to pick and choose from among the different definitions to figure out the meaning. If I use the word set, S-E-T, in a tennis context, in a tennis match, you know exactly what I'm talking about a set. You know what I mean when I say that one tennis player has won a set. When I talk about setting something down, I'm using the word set, but you know from context that it's a verb, that I am placing an object down on a, on a particular surface, maybe a table or a desk. The contextual meaning makes it unmistakable exactly what I mean when I use that word, even though it's got multiple definitions. Once in a while, I'll play with the different definitions and then I'll maybe use it as a play, as a play on words, as a pun. Then people know that I'm trying to be humorous to greater or lesser success. All of these are exactly the same in Chinese. These characters have multiple definitions. They can all be understood. You can pick and choose from among them to figure out exactly the meaning. So communication happens all the time. In English, in Chinese, most of the time, we, thank goodness, understand each other despite the large set of definitions that are out there. So I just want people to be aware of this and to understand, to know, to anticipate that there's gonna be people out there who will seek to elevate their perceived status by making things more complicated and therefore elevating themselves into a position of authority as someone who can navigate through the complexity. And I also want to uh, remind everyone that yin and yang, we have to look at it from all different angles, from one end of the spectrum and then from the other end. There is a human tendency among the students, the listeners, for complexity. This happens when we encounter a truth that is so simple, but we don't want to accept it. 
like, no, that can't be it. Oftentimes, I see this tendency among us when we are looking for something very profound, something that, you know, maybe is beyond easy understanding. We look for that. If we see something that is very simple, we dismiss it. And nah, that's not, that's not it. I want something that's more complicated. So you see, the human tendency for complexity, it actually runs both ways. And then the people that want things to be complicated as they listen to it, and the people who want to elevate themselves by making things more complicated, they have a natural match in one another. I'm just here to say that the complexity is not the Tao. The Tao can be simplified, it can be streamlined, it can be explained very clearly. So I'll use some examples to illustrate exactly what I mean by that. Now, here's the other part. And once again, I'm highlighting in this recap slide two parts that can illustrate or illuminate the meaning. The top part says easy to practice. And then the bottom part is cannot practice. So Lao Tzu is saying that, well, the Tao, it is not supposed to be difficult to apply. That if you have the will, if you have the determination, you can make it happen. And it is supposed to be very practical. You should be able to apply it to an everyday life. People can't do it. So that is the second part of the answer. It is that doing is another level beyond knowing. It's like when we talk about how the master can point out the path or the door, but then it is up to the disciple or the students to actually open that door or to walk that path. So there are two parts to this. If the Tao is not easily understood by people because it's made complex, then those people that fail to understand the simple Tao because they're looking for something complicated, well, they cannot apply what they don't understand. If you don't know it, you cannot do it. The, the other part is that sometimes there is a gap between knowing and doing. Even if you do know it, you may not necessarily translate it into action. So how can that be? Well, it actually happens all the time. In the spiritual tradition of the East, there is a story that illustrates that. It comes from a Zen Buddhist tradition, and I found it to be remarkable because it speaks to this chapter so clearly and so closely. And it is the story that is called the Burn Nest Zen Master. Here's how the story goes. During the Tang Dynasty, which is roughly 1200 years ago, there was a master of Zen Buddhism who became known to the people as the Burn Nest Zen Master. So it's a strange name. How did he get such a name? Well, you see, he got that name due to the unusual way that he lived. And it was because back in the days when he traveled, he had come across a large pine tree with branches that formed a spot where one could sit comfortably high off the ground. He decided to make his home there because it was a place where he could easily connect with nature. And because of the ample foliage of the tree, he would be protected, shielded from the elements and sit in comfort. There were other birds, many birds nesting in the pine tree as well. It was a large pine tree. They coexisted with the Zen master in harmony. So people started calling him the bird nest Zen master, because he's up there in the tree, in his nest. 
So whenever they wanted to speak with him, they would go to the pine tree and they would look for him in his nest. That is exactly what you see here in the picture that I have in the slide. So one day, there was a gentleman who came to visit. He was a renowned scholar and an important government official. This gentleman came to the tree and called up, Master, it is too dangerous for you to live up there. He's thinking, what if you take a fall? So up in the nest, the bird nest Zen master replied, Sir, actually it is your position that is dangerous. I am perfectly safe here. Now, the scholar understood the meaning of these words immediately. For you see, the master was not referring to his physical position at ground level. That was fine. Instead, the master was referring to his political position in the imperial administration because he was a government official. So thinking this, the gentleman asked, Master, do you mean my being an official in the dynasty? Why would that be dangerous? The Burness master replied, the fire of hidden plots continue to burn. The nature of treachery never stops. Why would it not be dangerous? He's answering the question with a question. Question, why would that be dangerous? The returning question, why would it not be? And the scholar had to admit, the master had a point. The life of a highly placed official was indeed precarious. The constant duplicity and betrayals from rival factions in the imperial hierarchy, well, that could destroy one's political career in an instant. If you were not careful, you could lose your life. So the gentleman could see this was a genuine insight from the Zen master. And that realization made him want to learn more. So he asked, Master, what is the great essence of Buddhist Dharma? The Zen master replied, all bad things do not perpetrate them. All good things uphold and do them. Now, the scholar was surprised and disappointed. Why? Because he thought the master would give him some sort of profound wisdom, something to think over, you know, perhaps over the span of several days. But what actually came out of the Zen master, what the Zen master said, all bad things, do not perpetrate them, don't do them, don't commit crimes, all good things, do those things, pursue those things, uphold them. Well, this sounded like simple-minded platitude. So he said dismissively, well, even a three-year-old child knows that. You know, what's so special about this wisdom, right? The birds and master nodded. Although three-year-old children know it, 80-year-old men cannot practice it. The end. So this is an often repeated story about the bird Zen master. And let's talk about this in detail. There's a lot that we can say to connect this story with the chapter we're studying now. First thing to note is that this story comes from 
Wu Dan Hui Yuan, which is the compendium of five lamps. This is a work, a collection, a compilation, a compendium that was compiled 827 years ago. So several hundred years after the time of the bird nest Zen master. Now, the bird nest Zen master was a historical figure. Some of the stories that we tell in the Tao is made up of fictional characters, like a fable, and sometimes animals. And sometimes uh, these are constructed to make a specific point. In this case, this was actually a historical tale where both parties, the Zen master and the gentleman who came to visit, they both lived in history as historical figures, figures who walked the earth back in the Tang Dynasty. The exchange brought a few interesting elements that we should note. First, let's take a look at one set of the exchange, the bird nest Zen master. Him living in the tree in his nest, so to speak, is symbolic of connection to nature. He decided to live there because it was a way for him to easily connect with nature. He could be sitting there contemplating nature, contemplating life, contemplating the Zen, reading his sutra, or just reflect on himself, his own studies, his own understanding, and perhaps enjoying a cool breeze wafting through the branches. The connection with nature is an underlying theme that is consistent in the Zen as well as the Tao tradition. Last time, I think everyone recalls, if you heard the talk last time, that Lao Tzu says his words have faces. His actions have a central principle. And this is because ancient Tao sages observed nature. And I'll remind everyone in a moment with a few examples, but basically by emulating nature, the thinking is that one can live one's life so much better because we are part of nature. We are creatures that exist within nature, not apart from it. So to connect with nature is related to being able to see things more clearly. The more you commune, connect with nature yourself, the more insights you discover that you can apply to life. You discover the part of humanity that is in inextricably linked and connected to nature. So connection with nature, extremely important. It is how we figure out what the Tao is that we should follow. The other side of the interchange, the exchange, is the scholar. So remember, he enjoyed wide renown as an accomplished scholar, and he was also a powerful government official. Back in those days, the context is that these political um, figures in ancient China were far more powerful than their counterparts today. Officials in ancient China partook in the power, the absolute power of the emperor. So they could decide what to do with everyday people with impunity. And sometimes this led to corruption. If you had people in those positions who were not very strong ethically, morally, who did not understand the Tao. So the material world understanding or you know, interpretation is that position and intelligence must be highly prized from that material perspective. This scholar had a high position as a government official, and his intelligence was well known because of his status as a literary figure that he was a well-known scholar. But in spiritual study, the point is made and understood that just because you have a position 
and you have academic accomplishment, those do not imply that you must be wise. Indeed, we see people in high positions who demonstrate the exact opposite of wisdom. We even see very intelligent people who are often found or seen as being very unwise. There is no equivalence between the two. Intelligence may not necessarily imply or lead to wisdom. And that's definitely what we see in the story. In the story, the scholar was aware of the dangers of the material world that came from contention. This is reflected in our world as well, that occasionally we ourselves come into a contention with other people. And you can just kind of look back on your own life and see that, yeah, you know, some time ago, I had an unpleasant exchange with someone else, that there was friction in my life. And maybe there was a time I lost my cool. I engaged in an argument, a shouting match. I shouldn't have done that. So there are dangers in the material world that mostly come from contention. How do we deal with that danger? How do we deal with contention? So that's where the Tao comes in. The Tao is about a set of ideas, concepts, teachings, principles that all help guide us away from danger, away from contention. And many of these ideas, concepts, principles are not that difficult to understand. This is why Lao Tzu says it is easy to know the Tao, even kids can understand it. The way that he explained the Tao in a very direct and straightforward way and be very plain spoken, it was meant to be so that the kids could understand it. And the words from the bird nest Zen master was the same way, intended to be direct and easy to understand. Now, it can, we can get ourselves in trouble because we find it difficult to put that easy, simple, clear Tao into daily practice. And this difficulty covers so many people, so many of us. Even for older people, as the Zen master pointed out, you know, some of these things we talk about, even 80-year-olds cannot cannot explain, cannot explain why they fail because they cannot do it. So that is reflected in the lines from this chapter where we have easy to understand that somehow, even if you understand them, you cannot put them into practice. So all of this made it an eye-opening moment for the gentleman, for the scholar in the story, he realized that the master was correct, that the basic wisdoms of the world were not difficult to know. The real difficulty was in the doing. And all too often, people fail to do what they knew to be right. So think about us. Haven't we all seen that too? Haven't we all sometimes experienced it? What we know to be right, we fail to do, to put into action. Now, the scholar himself was no exception to this, to this common phenomenon. He had taken a lot of pride in being knowledgeable. Look at me, I am the renowned scholar. Everybody knows me, everybody knows my work, my poetry is read by so many people. But now, in that exchange with the bird nest Zen master, he could see his knowledge did not translate necessarily into action. So as he thought about this, you can just imagine that the arrogant demeanor that he usually had, you know, as a well-known literary figure, is started to change. That if he had the wisdom to recognize the wisdom that was being presented to him, that he would begin to work on himself to practice, to cultivate, the virtue of humility. So that is the story of the bird nest Zen master. 
Now let's continue. Now, last time we were able to cover the middle section where Lao Tzu says, my words have basis, my actions have principle. They're ruled, my actions are ruled by a central principle of the Tao. These are guiding principles, and what he meant was that these would flow naturally in a simple and straightforward way, and to know the Tao leads to understanding Lao Tzu in terms of his words and actions. If we really understand the Tao, then what Lao Tzu says and what he did would be would not be strange. It would make sense. So when we talk about flowing naturally, it all comes from the observation of nature, uh, as I alluded to before. And last time, I used the example of water flowing in mountain streams as one observation that was readily available to the ancients. So what I talked before was that they looked that at water, they realized that it did not flow randomly. If you pour water in a high place, it flows to the low place every single time. In that sense, it is predictable. You know what's gonna happen. It follows the laws of nature. When that is applied to human beings, the idea is that every single one of us, there's part of our nature that has a yearning to be better. We want to be wiser. We want to know the world better or more clearly than we did before. We want to figure out what to do in difficult life situations. So there is a part of us that wants to know, to understand, to be better. And that is why we follow the principle of the Tao in bettering ourselves. There is also a part of us, because you know we're not water, there's a part of us that wants to just do nothing and be lazy and just relax and just let it go. I totally get that. At the end of the day, it's the balance between rest and work that's going to get us to the final destination. But if we were to persist in laying about doing nothing in a fog of apathy, ultimately, it is to our detriment. So we're not water, but we can benefit by emulating water. So water flows downhill, as I mentioned. It doesn't flow in every direction downhill. It flows in specific ways, depending on how the terrain is curved around. So we, too, have specific individual paths that we follow. They're unique to us. So then the question is, what happens when we get blocked? Observing nature, water gets blocked by something, maybe a boulder, maybe a large rock. Well, water doesn't complain. Water doesn't try to smash it. Water finds a way around it, and it does so very quickly. And that just means when we emulate water, we ourselves should not be frustrated when we're blocked. We should just be open-minded to look for another way to flow around. And there is always a way. In living life, I have found that if I keep my eyes open, I will always find a way to flow around the obstacles. If I can't see it, it's only because I am not looking in the right place. So this is the example that we used last time to talk about nature leading to the Tao, leading to human actions in emulating nature and the Tao. Another way that we illustrated the same thing was with the diagram. Some people do better when seen in this way. In this diagram form, we have multiple scenarios where the top one is proceeding without a plan. And when that happens, we know what's gonna be the result. We try random things, we're hoping for the best, but then we fail. Now, perhaps rarely, just by getting lucky, we can succeed, but we know that nine times out of 10, by not having a plan, we're not gonna succeed. Then the opposite, the extreme opposite end to not having a plan is having a plan that is very rigid, that is inflexible. And what can happen with a plan like that is that you come across an obstacle without flexibility, you can get around it, you get only frustration, you get blocked and frustrated. So then the concept 
of in the Tao is to be moderating between the extremes, the Tao of moderation. When you combine the above, when you moderate between the two, you get this principle about setting up a plan. You got to have a plan, but you got to have a flexible approach. So it's a combination of both. And it then makes sense that every time you come across an obstacle, you can get around it until you eventually find your way to success. So some people will actually find an easier time to understand what Lao Tzu meant looking at a diagram like this. And this takes us to pretty close to what we were last time, where the fourth part of the answer is that people oftentimes did not understand Lao Tzu was that they were mired in the material world. So they did not understand the formless Tao. To them, it's too abstract. To them, it seemed obvious that it would bring them no material benefits. So material benefits, I mean that in terms of monetary value or social prestige. So this Tao you're talking about, is it gonna make me money? Would it make me wealthy? Okay, well, not directly. But if you apply the Tao principles to your work, prosperity and abundance are natural side effects. But because it doesn't bring benefits directly, some people quickly will lose interest. And then the other question is, well, if I get to know this, is it going to make me look really good? Well, again, not directly. If by benefiting from understanding Tao principles, you're able to manage your life better than other people, then naturally you elevate yourself in terms of other people's perception of you. So because if there's no direct benefit, only indirect ones, there's going to be a whole lot of people who don't really want to get closer to an understanding of the Tao. So this means we now have the following mini summary. So this is just uh, summarizing everything we have talked about so far. People fail to understand the Tao because they tend to complicate things and they do this in multiple ways. And it's not just the people that teach the Tao, but also teach people who study the Tao. Some people just want things to be complicated. Strange but true. Number two, people fail to practice the Tao because of two possibilities. Well, they don't get it. How can they practice it? Or the other one, well, they do get it. They do understand it. They'll say, oh yeah, yeah, I know all about that. Oh, I, I heard that before. Hey, listen, I've been listening to these Tao talks for years. Believe me, I know, I know about that. Well, they can't necessarily put it into practice for one reason or another. So even if they do understand, they may not be able to walk the talk. And number three, people do not understand that Lao Tzu, when he spoke, what he did, those were all based on the Tao. So understanding the Tao leads to understanding of him. And then number four, people do not understand the Tao because the Tao was abstract, it's formless, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. Uh, with your hands, with your senses, you can't see it with your eyes, you can't hear it with your ears. You can, the only way to really feel the Tao is to experience living with the Tao, with the Tao teachings. So not being able to hold it is an impediment to people who are tied to a material world perspective. So this is what we have seen so far. There before we depart from this slide, I would like to make a quick observation to share with everyone. Uh, notice how all four of these reasons very much apply in our world today. It's not just ancient times, but today things haven't changed because human nature hasn't changed. We definitely have people who try to elevate themselves by making things more complex, as I alluded to. Uh, some people definitely study the Tao purely as a philosophy without applying it to life. So they know it, but they cannot do it. And th then there's the other category that there's a lot of people out there who have never heard of the Tao. 
never mind understanding DAO concepts. And finally, there are so many people among us who are just, you know, like we're busy with our lives in the material world. So, hey, listen, we, we can't be bothered with these nebulous ideas from, our, from some exotic Eastern sources. And that leads to ridicule, mockery, and so on. And there's more to say about that, but for now, it is time to return to chapter 70. We are on line six. Therefore, they do not understand me. This is the words of Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu saying, well, therefore people do not understand me. And here, Lao Tzu felt he had become too different to be understood. And he's so unusual that people find him to be not easy to grasp. And the same thing can happen to you as you study the Tao. What I mean is, to some of you, it may have already happened that people may think, you know, I'm not sure I get what you're talking about if you were to describe some of the concepts that you come across in the Tao. Now, the same idea is also expressed elsewhere in the Tao Te Ching. And as far as your life, I mean, even today, I think, you know, even later on today, there may be some concepts you have gotten to know that other people, well, to them, it'll be strange or unfamiliar. But let me go back to ancient times, go back to Lao Tzu himself. Elsewhere in the Tao Te Ching, he expressed the same concept that he's so different from others that people find him very hard to figure out. And in chapter 20 of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu talks about the specific differences. Like it's one thing to say, I'm different from others, or I'm too different, they don't understand me, but it's another to point out exactly what the differences are. So let's explore just for a moment, chapter 20, to see the specific differences that Lao Tzu is bringing up. People do not understand Lao Tzu. So in chapter 20, we have a bunch of lines. And what I'll do is that I'll focus on the red highlighted lines to talk about that. Like for instance, in line 11, Lao Tzu says, I alone am quiet and uninvolved. Right before that, Lao Tzu describes how people are. So basically, Lao Tzu is saying that people are noisy and excited. They like noise, they like excitement. Lao Tzu himself, line 11, prefers quietness and tranquility. So it's the same when you move down to line 15, the next highlighted line. Lao Tzu says, I alone seem lacking. Right above that, it's talking about how people have surplus. That just means that people accumulate. It's easy to identify with that because we, we too live in a materialistic world. People like to accumulate wealth, things. And a lot of times we even accumulate things we don't really need that become cluttered. We fill the house with things that don't really have a use, but then we say, that may come in handy one day. I'm gonna store it for a while. Well, it turns out there's endless number of things that you can store because of that. I may need this, I may need that, and pretty soon you're running out of room. So Lao Tzu is different. People accumulate, Lao Tzu seems lacking because he lives the simple life. The simple life is minimalist. It is about streamlining, simplifying, discarding whatever you don't need, share what you have more of with the people who don't have enough. That is the simple life. Now, moving down a little further to line 18, Lao Tzu says, I alone am muddled. So this needs to, ex needs to be explained in context. Right above that, he says people are bright. What that means is that 
people are putting the spotlight on themselves, they're showing themselves off, that this is flaunting, putting oneself on display. Laozi seems muddled in comparison because he practices the virtue of humility. He doesn't need to shine brightly for everyone to see, so he seems muddled. And then moving forward to line 20, Laozi says, I alone am obtuse. What does that mean? Well, we figure it out by looking at the line right above it, ordinary people are scrutinizing. What Laozi is saying here is that he seems obtuse because he prefers to be harsh only on himself while being easy on everyone else. People are the exact opposite. To see the truth of that, you only have to look around. When we look around in our world, we see that most people are critical, harsh, judgmental. That's what it means here by scrutinizing that they are harsh on other people, but they are very easy on themselves. When other people are tardy, they get mad. When they themselves are tardy, they have excuses. It's that type of thing. Whatever it is, we seem to be, a lot of people seem to be much harder on everyone else but themselves. If it's somebody else, they get mad. If it's them, well, yeah, it's okay. There, there are understandable reasons why. So that is the contrast. And then below that, 24, I alone am stubborn and lowly. What's that all about? Right above that, people all have goals. People have these lofty goals that are tied to the material world, like making more money or getting a better position socially. That's why Lao Tzu seems stubborn and lowly because his goals are spiritual in nature, not about material attainment. Therefore, all of those things, all of those five elements together leads to the very last line, 25, I alone am different from them. And throughout this particular chapter, he describes the difference as a huge chasm that it wasn't just a, a small gap that's easy to bridge. No, it's a huge chasm that he's too different. So now with this information about why people find Lao Tzu to be so different, so hard to understand, we now can provide this one. We started out with these questions. Why do people not understand Lao Tzu? What makes Lao Tzu so different that he is hard to understand? You just saw a very detailed breakdown of that, which we can now summarize. We can do a mini summary like we did before. And it's easier to see when we put it together in sort of like condensed form. Most people like noisy excitement. Tao sages, similar to Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu prefers tranquility, quiet reflections. So most people tend to accumulate clutter. Lao Tzu lives the simple life, and that's why he seems lacking, seems lacking in comparison. And then most people, bright, show themselves off. Look at me shine. Lao Tzu seems a model because he practices the virtue of humility. And then what you just heard, people are judgmental. They're criticizing, they're, they're harsh. Lao Tzu, not harsh, hard on himself, but easygoing, mellow with everyone else. The exact opposite. And number five, people have lofty materialistic goals. Lao Tzu, different. He's got goals that are, mature, that are spiritual in nature. Okay, now, now that we've laid it out this way, there's a specific reason why I wanted to do that. And that is, I want to get everyone to look at this chart, the left-hand column and the right-hand column. When you are able to get very close to the right-hand column, you begin to understand Lao Tzu and the Tao sages and the Tao itself. So now, my question to you is, where are you in this comparison? Are you closer 
to where most people are? Or are you closer to the Tao sages? The closer you are to Laozi in this scale, the more likely you are to understand what he's talking about, what he does. And I'm going to share with you my personal take on myself. And I will confess to everyone that I definitely begin on the left-hand column. And then over time, I gradually move toward the right-hand side. So hopefully I am now closer to the right-hand side than the left-hand side. But let me tell you, years and years ago, when I was going to college, you know, this uh, much younger version of Derek was someone who definitely was on the, the left-hand column. You know, noise and excitement, party all the time. In fact, when I requested my dorm room for college, I requested that they put me in the, in the party dorm, okay? I had already done my research. Every dorm had its reputation. One dorm was said to be wild. That's where I wanted to be. Now, it didn't take any more than a month for me to realize living in that party dorm that I had made a mistake, that the party atmosphere, the noise, the excitement that I thought I wanted, you know, in my dumb younger brain, that was actually not something that contributed to my true essence. That was when I discovered that I really wanted to be more like Lao Tzu, the tranquility, the quiet reflections. So I've been slowly making my way from the left to the right. Same thing with number two. I used to have a huge amount of clutter. And it is over the past few decades that I've been slowly trying to get rid of them. I used to have huge magazine collections. Then one day I realized that I wasn't revisiting any of them. I was holding on to this clutter for no reason. So I eventually had to get rid of them and I was better off for it. So I am beginning to understand the appeal of living the simple life. I'm moving from the left to the right. And showing off, yeah, the younger version of Derek definitely liked to show off. And that was the reason, that was uh, a lot of the way that I spent my time. Uh, it uh, occupied, preoccupied my attention back in those days. But since that time, I've been moving slowly to the right-hand side to, to be humble, to practice humility. And I find that I like it a lot. You know, I liked it before when I was receiving applause and then I would be, you know, worried about not getting the applause. But then now I realize that the virtue of humility is where I find peace and true happiness. So same with number four. I was much, much more critical because I was so incredibly arrogant. So, you know, nothing was good enough for me. Nobody was smart enough, etc. Now I see the value of being more like Lao Tzu. I should be more demanding on myself and I should be easier on everybody else, which is the exact opposite of how I used to be. And how I used to be was that I thought that I would attain a, high, a very high level position within an organization. That's what I was thinking. And then by virtue of studying the Tao, I actually did arrive at a point when I realized that those goals were no longer that important to me. In fact, they faded in significance. So now the goal for me is tied to the Tao. My goal, it's much more important to me now to be spending this time with you than to spend the time in pursuit of some position somewhere. That doesn't have any meaning for me. This right here, this process going on, this has all the meaning for me in the world. So moving on. Line seven, those who understand me are few, 
So for this one, let me break it down for you. Only four characters. The first character means understand. Zhi, to understand or to know. The second character, wo, it means me, I. So this is the modern form of me or I. This is still in use every day in modern Mandarin. And then third character, zhe, those who. And it only makes sense when you when you combine it with wo, the previous character. And then the last character, xi, that just means rare, few, few in number. So when you put it together, you cannot exactly string this uh, literal translation, transcription into uh, a legible translation, understandable translation. Uh, understand me, those who rare. Okay, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What it really means is those who understand me are few or are rare. Then the what we have seen the five points that we saw in Tao Te Ching chapter 20, well, they tell us why. The Tao mindset is far beyond the ordinary. If one day you can be in complete alignment with the way Lao Tzu thinks, you're also going to find yourself very distant from the rest of humanity. There's going to be a huge chasm between yourself and them. So, because of the difference, because the ordinary mindset is so different from the mind, mindset of the Tao, when people encounter the Tao, they can react in different ways. And Lao Tzu says three different ways. He talks about this in Tao Te Ching chapter 41. Lao Tzu describes their reactions, the three different reactions. These are well-known lines from the Tao Te Ching that when higher people hear of the Tao, they diligently practice it. So that's the first type of reaction. The second type, average people hear of the Tao, they sometimes keep it, sometimes lose it. So that's most people sometimes practice the Tao, but sometimes not. And then lower level people, when they hear of the Tao, they laugh loudly at it, they mock it, they deride the Tao. They are dismissive. And think about the connection between this and the story of the Burnest Zen Master. When the scholar heard the wisdom from the Zen Master, which is basically, hey, you know all the good things out there? Go ahead and do those. You know all those bad things? Don't do any of them. And he's like, you know, well, what is that? That's That's not... That's something that even little kids can understand. How is that a profound wisdom? Okay, that's one of the possible ways to react to the Tao. Like, you know, what is that? Sometimes it's like, you know, well, I don't even get it. That sounds just funny. Uh, other times it's just that, well, I already know that. It's, uh, it's not a big deal. Like, what's so difficult about it? So those are the different ways to react. And now we are getting into the second question, the key question that we started out with. We saw the five points of the differences, and now we are going to be, uh, in a moment, we're going to be delving into the question about uh, whether or not uh, we can figure out uh, how few exactly there are. Uh, for now, though, let's, uh, let's focus on this question. Can we count ourselves among them, among the, the few that actually understand the Tao? So remember, there are three different reactions. Here's the way that I'll describe them. The high-level people, diligent. They diligently practice the Tao. Everyday people, average people, they're dabblers. They dabble in the Tao. They sometimes practice it, sometimes not. And then the lower level people are dismissive. They laugh at it. So what is our reaction to the Tao? Well, hopefully it is not dismissive. Hopefully it's going to be at least in the middle and hopefully in the higher range of that. We can count ourselves as being among the people who understand Lao Tzu if 
were in the higher level that were practicing the DAO diligently. So here, at least I can say honestly that I've been adhering to this for the past few decades. I've been sticking with the DAO diligently. Uh, and that's not to say that I don't uh, take breaks. I do. Uh, that uh, when you recharge your batteries, that's what allows you to continue forward. But that's part of being diligent is to look after yourself. Now, many people, perhaps most people, perhaps many of us, were less likely to actually understand the DAO if we're still in the average level, because when you're dabbling, you're not being consistent. You're not being diligent. So you could understand a few ideas, a few pieces of the puzzle here and there, but not the whole thing. And then lastly, the answer is no, we cannot count ourselves among them if we're still in the lower level. If you find all of this as being laughable, that is uh, something that you can, that you would mock, I don't think there's any of us here that belong to the, to the lowest level. So next question, how few are they exactly? So we've identified that the people who understand are the ones who practice the doubt diligently. Looking at this right here, it doesn't mean there are three categories. That doesn't necessarily imply that it's one third of the population that would be the ones that understand Laozi, that would be diligent. Of course, one third would be a minority, but what Laozi has in mind is that it's even fewer than one third the people that actually understand. Laozi talks about it in chapter 50 of the Tao Te Ching. So I'm going to bring that back just to kind of remind everyone what he says in that chapter. This is also a good illustration to what I talked about before, the interpretational issue. So chapter 50 of the Tao Te Ching, it says, coming into life, entering death, the followers of life, three in 10, the followers of death, three in 10, those whose lives are moved toward death, also three in 10, okay? So this is the accounting of the people who cover the majority of the population out there. Three in 10, three types together, that's nine out of 10. Then the exception, the one in 10, not mentioned in these lines, but further down below is, I've heard of those who are good at cultivating life. Those are the exceptions. Those are the ones who are diligent in practicing the Tao. So it's one out of 10. Now, let me explain what I meant by interpretational issues and incorrect interpretations. When I talk about interpretations, there's a tendency for people to say, well, it's a matter of opinion. Some things are indeed matters of opinion. These interpretations tend not to be matters of opinion. They tend to be obvious mistakes that you can tell. So here in this particular line, this gets misinterpreted in one way, that the line says in 10, there are three, so three out of 10, people translate that as one third. So it's the difference between 30% and 33%. So why would they mistranslate it in that way? Well, because this expression, shi yu shan, is a clear expression of three out of 10. When people want to say one third in Mandarin, they say one out of three. So if you don't know those expressions, you're going to be puzzling about the mentioning of three here. And the character three is reiterated at the end of line two, line three, and line five. You see three categories. You see the number three. You don't know Mandarin. So then the misinterpretation is that each category is one third. That's how mistranslations occur. It's not a valid translation. It's not a valid interpretation. It's not a matter of opinion. So now we have the answer that we were looking for. Those who are good at cultivating life, the ones who are diligent 
to practice the Tao when they hear about the Tao, one in 10 approximately. We're back to this familiar table with the diligent dabbling and the dismissive. Now we see that the diligent people about one in 10. That describes us if we are diligent. Moving on, so line eight, thus I am highly valued. So this is not Lao Tzu being egotistical, being arrogant about placing a high value on himself. What he's saying is that because it is few, it, it is rare, the actual understanding of the Tao is rare, it has value because of it. Because if you understand the Tao, the, that understanding is of great value. Few can be estimated as one in 10, as you saw, or about 10% of the overall population. So there are two different ways, as you have seen, for us to see if we are among the few. Are we in the 10%? Well, question number one, how close can we come to the way Lao Tzu thinks? So remember that those two columns, the left to the right, I know I've been trying to move from the left to the right. The closer I get to the right, the more I can see myself as being among the few, the 10%. The other question, how consistent are we in practicing the Tao? If we're practicing the Tao consistently, then we have a very good chance to being within the 10%. If we focus on it sometimes and then forget it other times, or if we're not consistent in our practice, then we're like the average people. We're just dabbling in the Tao. So now we're approaching the last line. Line nine says, therefore, the sage wears plain clothes, but holds jade. So let me start to break it down first with the First four characters, Shi Shen Ren. The sage, in this case, that's the uh, last four, last two characters that you see. The third and fourth characters in this line, Shen Ren. The sage can mean Tao sage in general or sages from the past. And we know this because Lao Tzu oftentimes talk about the ancient masters, the masters of antiquity. These are the sages from ancient times even more ancient than Lao Tzu. These are the ones that he studied from. And then the next two characters, plain clothes, wearing plain clothes. Here, plain clothes is not literal. It is a metaphor for ordinary appearance. And it's not just, it's not, um, just external appearance. So, uh, so first of all, it doesn't mean the actual clothes. It's the external appearance. But it's not just the external physical appearance. It is also demeanor. It's your mannerism. It's the, it's the, uh, the sense that you project, the energy that you project, what people can perceive about you in the Tao context. If you cultivate the Tao, if you practice the Tao, people are going to see you as being very approachable, not some sort of, uh, uh, very, uh, very aloof person who keeps himself or herself away from other people. And then let's continue on with this uh, description. So sages understand one thing. It is the insecure ego that needs to draw attention. It is only when you are lacking in that confidence, self-assurance, that you need to draw attention to compensate for that. Sages are naturally humble, which means they're naturally very confident about themselves, but that humility means that they prefer to come and go quietly without drawing a lot of attention. If people notice them, that's great. They're not about to hide, but if people don't notice them, that's okay too. So, in terms of apparel, they often choose to wear ordinary clothing and it makes it easier for them to blend in. So what I mean by that 
is that you won't see them wearing flashy clothing, nothing that draws a lot of attention, nothing that's especially glaring to the eyes, nothing that's uh, out of the ordinary. They just want to be comfortable and relaxed. And when they speak, they talk in a gentle way. They speak softly without the need to shout, without yelling, raising volume. So these are all aspects of wearing plain clothes, which is not a literal description, but metaphoric. And then the last two words, these are the most important two words in this entire chapter, Huai Yu. And the last character, Yu, means jade. Jade, again, just like clothing, is not literal. Not a literal piece of jade. It's the metaphor for the precious Tao. So sages hold the Tao within like a treasure that should be cherished. And the same character, Yu, is used elsewhere in the Tao Te Ching. And I want to point this out because it is used in a different way that unless you understand the context, it can throw you for a loop. In Tao Te Ching, chapter 39, Lao Tzu also uses the exact same character, but he uses it in a different way to make the same point. So let me highlight the usage here and then the usage in 39 so you can see the difference. Here's the usage that we see in the chapter that we're working with. Sages wear plain clothes but holds jade, yu, and that's metaphoric for the precious Tao. In chapter 39, it looks like this. Lao Tzu says, do not wish to be shiny like jade, be dull like rocks. So I want to point out for everyone's attention that in 70, holding jade, jade being a metaphor for the Tao is used in a positive context, like you want to hold jade. It's a good thing to hold the jade. 39, jade is used in a negative context. Do not wish to be shiny like jade. Here, it's used as a metaphor too, but it's used in a different way. It's saying that jade is compared to someone who's shiny, like someone who wants to show off. So it's making the same point that you want to have ordinary appearance. In 70, the idea is that you hold the valuable Tao within, so it's not shown, it is not advertised. In 39, it's basically saying that you don't want to advertise yourself, you don't want to shine like an egomaniac, you want to be dull like rocks, meaning you want to blend in. So to be dull like rocks is the same as wearing plain clothes. So the point is similar. Dull cultivators should assume an ordinary appearance. The usage in 39, jade is someone who draws attention. In 70, jade is the precious Tao. So in 39, ordinary appearance is to be dull like rocks. In 70, it's the metaphor, wear plain clothes. So they're actually talking about the same thing. It's just that the character jade is used in two different ways. So I just wanted you to be aware. Let's uh, finish up this chapter. What are we talking about when it comes to holding the jade? So sages feel no need to advertise the Tao they also don't feel the need to hide it, to keep it out of sight, so they're holding it. So that means if someone is asking about the Tao, the sage is happy to provide answers. And when you are holding the jade, the idea is that we should all be approaching the Tao the same way. So if no one asks about the Tao, the sage makes no attempt to drop hints. Like, is there some kind of questions you want to ask me? Maybe about the Tao? Hmm? Well, the sage doesn't need to advertise the Tao nor hide it. So it's the path of moderation. So 
The last point to be made is that sages much prefer to demonstrate the Tao with actions instead of words. So rather than to try to engage everyone in a discussion of the Tao, they prefer to show it through what they do. This brings us to the concluding remarks about Jade. Holding the Tao within, this whole idea of wearing plain clothes and holding Jade. Let's talk about holding the Tao within. The more you apply the Tao, the more it becomes your treasure. So here, the main point is that it's not enough to know the meaning of the Tao. You must also do. So that's why the more you apply it, the more of a treasure it becomes. Next, as you apply the Tao, you're going to discover that it is infinitely useful in every aspect of life. It is, if I were to compare it with uh, in modern vernacular, I would almost say that it becomes sort of like your secret superpower, that you can do things beyond what other people can do only because you're not seeing the situation clearly. It is your secret superpower. It is the jade. It is not an object, and therefore, it cannot be taken away from you. I hope that makes sense. You cannot lose it. It's who you are. No one can pry it away from you. Next bullet, you feel no need to advertise it like the sages themselves. And the Tao, it does not call attention to itself either. You could go through your day without people realizing that you are holding the precious jade. And most people, indeed, they can't see it. They are not aware of it. Even if they see you demonstrate the Tao in action, they may not recognize that's what you have done. It is only the other people holding their own jade that can see the Tao you are holding in your hand. That kind of makes it special too. Your secret superpower gives you the superpower of perception, supervision. And then lastly, this is what it means to have ordinary appearance that is the plain clothes that you wear. Beneath this unremarkable layer externally that most people cannot see through is the few and the extraordinary. That's the Tao Cultivator, and I hope that is who you are. This brings us to the end of the line-by-line -line explanation of Chapter 70. So I would like to take everyone through the paraphrase. Luckily, it's a short chapter, so we can go about this in at a nice, even pace. Section one of Tao Te Ching 70 is the beginning part, the two lines that talk about the Tao, the words uh, of Lao Tzu being easy to understand, but not so easy for the people to understand or practice. So here is the paraphrase that I would like to offer. The words of Lao Tzu are meant to be easy to understand and easy to apply in everyday situations. Unfortunately, most people have a lot of trouble understanding and applying them. This is, of course, a puzzling statement. Then we go to the second section where Lao Tzu explains it in more details and he wants to talk about having a basis in the Tao for his words and actions. And this is the crucial part that people don't understand. So let me offer to paraphrase it in the following manner. What Lao Tzu taught are based on reality, not philosophical speculations. 
he required himself to be consistent in words and actions. So he lived his life in accordance to the principles of the Tao. Thus, people who did not take the time to learn the principles will not understand the actions based on them, nor the words expressing or explaining them. They had no understanding of Laozi at all. Then here we are arriving at the final concluding section of Tao Te Ching 70. Only three lines to wrap it up. This is where we get the holding jade. And I would like to offer to paraphrase in the following way. Those who do understand Laozi are relatively few in number. This makes them and the teachings of Laozi all the more valuable. The Tao they have is like a piece of priceless jade. They hold it deep within while appearing the same as everyone else. This is what makes them all the more extraordinary. So that is the paraphrase that I am hoping captures the essence of chapter 70. Now, let me offer everyone the full circle to really wrap everything up. So in the last line of Tao Te Ching 70, Lao Tzu says, the sage wears plain clothes and holds jade, as we have just gone over. Now, we can link this back to the first line, and we can see the Tao is easy to understand, but then the world does not understand. So when you think about the beginning and the end together, and going back from the end to the beginning, you can see the meaning is connected. See, the world cannot look beyond the plain appearance the plain clothes, to see the precious jade that is being held within. That's the reason why, although the precious jade, the essence is simplicity, the world cannot see it, cannot look beyond the plain appearance, and that's why they cannot understand what Lao Tzu says or what he does. This may be true in your own life, the more you and I study the Tao, the more it's going to be so that people may not understand the extraordinary Tao within you. And if you find cases where people express puzzlement about what you say or what you do, or how you are able to see something, do something, they don't understand. Well, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. It can just mean you are on the right track. You are getting close to that right-hand column to become more like the way Lao Tzu thinks. So finally, keep it in mind. Wear plain clothes and hold jade. And now we can see that it means com something completely different than perhaps it did upon first glance. Time to do the summary. Last time, part one, we talked about becoming more like Lao Tzu. So this is to emulate Lao Tzu in having a basis for your words. So you want to consider your words carefully, you want to speak the truth, and you want to be gentle and compassionate. So you want to base your words on the gentle and compassionate Tao. Second, you want to have your actions be guided by the Tao as a centralizing principle. So then the question to ask is, what is your intention? Is it Tao-centric? And what is your action? Is it something that contributes to the greater good? So this is what we talked about last time. What about the summary for this time? Be among the few, the one in 10, the 10% of the population. 
be among the few who really do actually understand. How do we do that? First, we must practice consistently. Diligence is the key to elevate yourself to the higher level. Number two, wear plain clothes. As you saw in the explanation, this is not literal. This means metaphorically that you don't want to be flashy, dazzling, trying to draw attention. So let your words and actions reflect your natural humility. Lastly, hold jade. This is the most important part. Keep the Tao in your heart like the priceless treasure that it is. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us all travel safely so we can meet again. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.